Chapter Twenty Five, Section Five, Part E of Capital Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Capital: A Critical Analysis of Capitalist Production, Volume One, by Karl Marx, translated from the Third German Edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Frederick Engels. Part Seven. The Accumulation of Capital. Chapter 25. The General Law of Capitalist Accumulation. Section 5. Illustrations of the General Law of Capitalist Accumulation. Part E. The British Agricultural Proletariat. Nowhere does the antagonistic character of capitalistic product and accumulation assert itself more brutally than in the progress of English agriculture, including cattle breeding, and the retrogression of the English agricultural labourer. Before I turn to his present situation, a rapid retrospect. Modern agriculture dates in England from the middle of the 18th century, although the revolution in landed property, from which the changed mode of production starts as a basis, has a much earlier date. If we take the statements of Arthur Young, a careful observer, though a superficial thinker, as to the agricultural labourer of 1771, the latter plays a very pitiable part compared with his predecessor of the end of the fourteenth century. Quote, when the labourer could live in plenty and accumulate wealth, end quote. Footnote. James E. Thorold Rogers, Professor of Political Economy in the University of Oxford, A History of Agriculture and Prices in England, Oxford, 1866, Volume 1, page 690. This work, the fruit of patient and diligent labour, contains in the two volumes that have so far appeared only the period from 1259 to 1400. The second volume contains simply statistics. It is the first authentic history of prices of the time that we possess. And footnote. Not to speak of the 15th century. Quote, the golden age of the English labourer in town and country. End quote. We need not, however, go back so far. In a very instructive work for the year 1777, we read, quote, The great farmer is nearly mounted to a level with him, the gentleman, while the poor labourer is depressed almost to the earth. His unfortunate situation will fully appear by taking a comparative view of it only forty years ago and at present. Landlord and tenant have both gone hand in hand in keeping the labourer down. End quote. Footnote. Reasons for the late increase of the poor rates or a comparative view of the prices of labour and provisions. London, 1777, pages 5 and 11, and footnote. It is then proved in detail that the real agricultural wages between 1737 and 1777 fell nearly one quarter, or 25 per cent. Quote, Modern policy, says Dr. Richard Price also, quote, is indeed more favourable to the higher classes of people, and the consequences may in time prove that the whole kingdom will consist of only gentry and beggars, or of grandees and slaves. End quote. Footnote. Dr. Richard Price. Observations on Reversionary Payments, 6th edition, by W. Morgan, London, 1803. Volume 11, pages 158 and 159. Price remarks on page 159, quote, The nominal price of day labor is at present no more than about four times, or at most five times higher than it was in the year 1514. But the price of corn is seven times, and of flesh meat and raiment about fifteen times higher. So far, therefore, has the price of labor been even from advancing in proportion to the increase in the expenses of living, that it does not appear that it bears now half the proportion to those expenses that it did bear. End quote. End footnote. Nevertheless, the position of the English agricultural laborer from 1770 to 1780, with regard to his food and dwelling, as well as to his self-respect, amusements, etc., is an ideal never attained again since that time. His average wage, expressed in pints of wheat, was from 1770 to 1771, 90 pints. In Eden's time, 1797, only 65. In 1808, but 60. Footnote. Barton, Loco Citato, page 26. For the end of the 18th century, see Eden Loco Citato. End footnote. 
The state of the agricultural labourer at the end of the anti-Jacobin war, during which landed proprietors, farmers, manufacturers, merchants, bankers, stockbrokers, army contractors, etc., enriched themselves so extraordinarily, has been already indicated above. The nominal wages rose in consequence partly of the bank-note depreciation, partly of a rise in the price of the primary means of subsistence independent of this depreciation. But the actual wage variation can be evidenced in a very simple way, without entering into details that are here unnecessary. The poor law and its administration were in 1795 and 1814 the same. It will be remembered how this law was carried out in the country districts. In the form of alms, the parish made up the nominal wage to the nominal sum required for the simple vegetation of the labourer. The ratio between the wages paid by the farmer and the wage deficit made good by the parish shows us two things. First, the falling of wages below their minimum. Second, the degree in which the agricultural labourer was a compound of wage labourer and pauper, or the degree in which he had been turned into a serf of his parish. Let us take one county that represents the average condition of things in all counties. In Northamptonshire, in 1795, the average weekly wage was seven shillings sixpence. The total yearly expenditure of a family of six persons, thirty-six pounds twelve shillings and five pence. Their total income, twenty-nine pounds and eighteen shillings. Deficit made good by the parish, six pounds fourteen shillings five pence. In 1814, in the same county, the weekly wage was twelve shillings twopence. The total yearly expenditure of a family of five persons, fifty-four pounds eighteen shillings and fourpence. Their total income, thirty-six pounds two shillings deficit made good by the parish eighteen pounds six shillings four pence footnote perry locus Citato, page eighty six and footnote in seventeen ninety five the deficit was less than a quarter the wage in eighteen fourteen more than half it is self-evident that under these circumstances the meagre comforts that eden still found in the cottage of the agricultural labourer had vanished by eighteen fourteen footnote Perry, Locus Citato, page 213, and footnote. Of all the animals kept by the farmer, the labourer, the instrumentum vocals, was thenceforth the most oppressed, the worst nourished, the most brutally treated. The same state of things went on quietly until, quote, the swing riots in 1830 revealed to us, that is, the ruling classes, by the light of blazing cornstacks, that misery and black mutinous discontent smouldered quite as fiercely under the surface of agricultural as of manufacturing England. End quote. Footnote. S. Lane, Locus Citato, page 62. and footnote. At this time, Sattler in the House of Commons christened the agricultural labourers white slaves and a bishop echoed the epithet in the upper house. The most notable political economist of that period, E. G. Wakefield, says, quote, The peasant of the south of England is not a freeman, nor is he a slave. He is a pauper. End quote. Footnote. England and America, London, 1833, volume 1, page 47. End footnote. The time just before the repeal of the Corn Laws threw new light on the condition of the agricultural labourers. On the one hand, it was to the interest of the middle-class agitators to prove how little the corn laws protected the actual producers of the corn. On the other hand, the industrial bourgeoisie foamed with sullen rage at the denunciations of the factory system by the landed aristocracy, at the pretended sympathy with the woes of the factory operatives, of those utterly corrupt, heartless and genteel loafers, and at their diplomatic zeal for factory legislation. It is an old English proverb that, when thieves fall out, honest men come by their own, and, in fact, the noisy, passionate quarrel between the two fractions of the ruling class about the question which of the two exploited the labourers the more shamefully was on each hand the midwife of the truth. Earl Shaftesbury, then Lord Ashley, was commander-in-chief in the aristocratic, philanthropic, anti-factory campaign. He was, therefore, in 1845, a favourite subject in the revelations of the Morning Chronicle on the condition of the agricultural labourers. This journal, then the most important liberal organ, sent special commissioners into the agricultural districts who did not content themselves with mere general descriptions and statistics, but published the names both of the labouring families examined and of their landlords. The following list gives the wages paid in three villages in the neighbourhood of Blandford, Wimborne, and Poole. 
The villages are the property of Mr. G. Banks and of the Earl of Shaftesbury. It will be noted that, just like Banks, this low church pope, this head of English pietists, pockets a great part of the miserable wages of the labourers under the pretext of house rent. Summary of the three tables given. They show the details of fourteen families from three villages, and gives numbers for number of children in the families, the number of members in each family, the weekly wage of the men and the weekly wage of the children, totaling into a weekly income of the whole family, which ranges from five shillings to eleven shillings sixpence. It then goes on to list the weekly rent, which ranges from ten pence to two shillings. In the next line, the total weekly wage after deduction of the rent is given, ending up with the weekly income per head, which ranges from seven pence to two shillings one three fifth pence. End table. Footnote. London Economist, May twenty ninth, eighteen forty five, page two hundred ninety. End footnote. The repeal of the Corn Laws gave a marvellous impulse to the English agriculture. Footnote. The landed aristocracy advanced themselves to this end, of course per parliament, funds from the state treasury, at a very low rate of interest, which the farmers have to make good at a much higher rate. End footnote. Drainage on the most extensive scale, new methods of stall feeding, and of the artificial cultivation of green crops, introduction of mechanical manuring apparatus, new treatment of clay soils, increased use of numeral manures, employment of the steam engine, and of all kinds of new machinery, more intensive cultivation generally, characterize this epoch. Mr. Pusey, chairman of the Royal Agricultural Society, declares that the relative expenses of farming have been reduced nearly one-half by the introduction of new machinery. On the other hand, the actual return of the soil rose rapidly. Greater outlay of capital per acre, and, as a consequence, more rapid concentration of farms, were essential conditions of the new method. Footnote. The decrease of the middle-class farmers can be seen especially in the census category farmer's son, grandson, brother, nephew, daughter, granddaughter, sister, niece. In a word, the members of his own family, employed by the farmer. This category numbered, in 1851, 216,851 persons. In 1861, only 176,151 persons. From 1851 to 1871, the farms under 20 acres fell by more than 900 in number, those between 50 and 75 acres fell from 8,253 to 6,370. The same thing occurred with all other farms under 100 acres. On the other hand, during the same 20 years, the number of large farms increased. Those of 300 to 500 acres rose from 7,771 to 8,410. Those of more than 500 acres from 2,755 to 3,914 those of more than 1,000 acres, from 492 to 582. End footnote. At the same time, the area under cultivation increased, from 1846 to 1856, by 464,119 acres, without reckoning the great area in the eastern counties, which was transformed from rabbit warrens and poor pastures into magnificent cornfields. It has already been seen that, at the same time, the total number of persons employed in agriculture fell. As far as the actual agricultural labourers of both sexes and of all ages are concerned, their number fell from 1,241,396 in 1851 to 1,163,217 in 1861. Footnote. The number of shepherds increased from 12,517 to 25,559. End footnote. If the English Register General, therefore, rightly remarks, quote, The increase of farmers and farm labourers since 1801 bears no kind of proportion to the increase of agricultural produce. End quote. Footnote. Census, Logositeto, page 36. End footnote. This disproportion obtains much more for the last period, when a positive decrease of the agricultural population went hand in hand with increase of the area under cultivation, with more intensive cultivation, unheard of accumulation of the capital incorporated with the soil, and devoted to its working, an augmentation in the product of the soil without parallel in the history of English agriculture, 
plethoric rent-rolls of landlords and growing wealth of the capitalist farmers if we take this together with the swift unbroken extension of the markets that is the towns and the reign of free trade then the agricultural labourer was at last post tot discrimina rerum placed in circumstances that ought secundum arium to have made him drunk with happiness but professor rogers comes to the conclusion that the lot of the english agricultural labourer of to-day not to speak of his predecessor in the last half of the fourteenth and in the fifteenth century but only compared with his predecessor from seventeen hundred and seventy to seventeen hundred and eighty has changed for the worse to an extraordinary extent that quote, the peasant has again become a serf and a serf worse fat and worse clothed footnote rogers locus Hateto, page six hundred and ninety three page ten mr rogers belongs to the liberal school is a personal friend of cobden and bright and therefore no laudato temporis acti and footnote dr julian hunter in his epoch-making report on the dwellings of the agricultural labourers says quote, the cost of the hind a name for the agricultural labourer inherited from the time of serfdom is fixed at the lowest possible amount on which he can live the supplies of wages and shelter are not calculated on the profit to be derived from him he is a zero in farming calculations footnote public health seventh report eighteen hundred and sixty five page two hundred and forty two it is therefore nothing unusual either for the landlord to raise a labourer's rent as soon as he hears that he is earning a little more or for the farmer to lower the wage of the labourer because his wife has found a trade locus aetato and footnote the means of subsistence being always supposed to be a fixed quantity footnote locus aetato page one hundred and thirty five and footnote as to any further reduction of his income he may say nihil habio nihil curo he has no fears for the future because he has now only the spare supply necessary to keep him he has reached the zero from which are dated the calculations of the farmer come what will he has no share either in prosperity or adversity End quote. footnote locus Ateto, page one hundred and thirty four and footnote in the year eighteen hundred and sixty three an official inquiry took place into the conditions of nourishment and labour of the criminals condemned to transportation and penal servitude the results are recorded in two voluminous blue books among other things it is said quote, from an elaborate comparison between the diet of convicts in the convict prisons in england and that of paupers in workhouses and of free labourers in the same country it certainly appears that the former are much better fed than either of the two other classes footnote report of the commissioners relating to transportation and penal servitude london eighteen sixty three pages forty two and fifty and footnote whilst the amount of labour required from an ordinary convict under penal servitude is about one half of what would be done by an ordinary day labourer and quote footnote loc page seventy seven memoranda by the lord chief justice and footnote a few characteristic depositions of witnesses john smith governor of the edinburgh prison deposes quote, number five thousand and fifty six the diet of the english prisons is superior to that of ordinary labourers in england number fifty it is the fact that the ordinary agricultural labourers in scotland very seldom get any meat at all answer number three thousand forty seven is there anything that you are aware of to account for the necessity of feeding them very much better than ordinary labourers certainly not number three thousand and forty eight do you think that further experiments ought to be made in order to ascertain whether a dietary might not be hit upon for prisoners employed on public works nearly approaching to the dietary of free labourers footnote locus Hateto, volume eleven minutes of evidence and footnote he the agricultural labourer might say i work hard and have not enough to eat and when in prison i did not work harder where i had plenty to eat and therefore it is better for me to be in prison again than here End quote. footnote locus Hateto, volume one appendix page two hundred and eighty and footnote from the tables appended to the first volume of the report i have compiled the annexed comparative summary this table lists the weekly amount of nutrients of a convict in portland a sailor in the navy a soldier a working coachmaker compositor and an agricultural labourer 
showing that the compositor and the agricultural labourer are the lowest of them all. End table. The general result of the inquiry by the Medical Commission of 1863 on the food of the lowest fat classes is already known to the reader. He will remember that the diet of a great part of the agricultural labourers' families is below the minimum necessary to arrest starvation diseases. This is especially the case in all the purely rural districts of Cornwall, Devon, Somerset, Wilts, Stafford, Oxford, Berks, and Harts. The nourishment obtained by the labourer himself, says Dr. E. Smith, quote, is larger than the average quantity indicates since he eats a larger share necessary to enable him to perform his labour of food than the other members of the family including in the poorer districts nearly all the meat and bacon the quantity of food obtained by the wife and also by the children at the period of rapid growth is in many cases in almost every county deficient and particularly in nitrogen End quote. Footnote. public health sixth report eighteen sixty four pages two hundred and thirty eight 249, 261, and 262, and footnote. The male and female servants living with the farmers themselves are sufficiently nourished. Their number fell from 288,277 in 1851 to 204,962 in 1861. The labor of women in the fields, says Dr. Smith, quote, whatever may be its disadvantages, is under present circumstances of great advantage to the family, since it adds that amount of income which provides shoes and clothing and pays the rent, and thus enables the family to be better fed. End quote. Footnote. Loco page 262. End footnote. One of the most remarkable results of the inquiry was that the agricultural labourer of England, as compared with other parts of the United Kingdom, is considerably the worst fed, as the appended table shows. Quantities of carbon and nitrogen weekly consumed by an average agricultural adult. England, grains of carbon 46,673, grains of nitrogen 1,594. Wales, grains of carbon 48,354, grains of nitrogen 2,031. Scotland, grains of carbon 48,980, grains of nitrogen 2,348. Ireland, grains of carbon 43,366, grains of nitrogen 2,434. Footnote. Logo Citato, page 17. The English agricultural labourer receives only a quart as much milk and half as much bread as the Irish. Arthur Young, in his tour in Ireland at the beginning of this century, already noticed the better nourishment of the latter. The reason is simply this, that the poor Irish farmer is incomparably more humane than the rich English. As regards Wales, that which is said in the text holds only for the south-west. All the doctors there agree that the increase of the death rate through tuberculosis, srophila, etc., increases in intensity with the deterioration of the physical condition of the population, and all ascribe this deterioration to poverty. His, the farm labourer's, keep is reckoned at about five pence a day, but in many districts it was said to be of much less cost to the farmer, himself very poor. A morsel of the salt meat or bacon, salted and dried to the texture of mahogany, and hardly worth the difficult process of assimilation, is used to flavour a large quantity of broth or gruel, of meal and leeks, and day after day this is the labourer's dinner. The advance of industry resulted for him, in this harsh and damp climate, in Quote, the abandonment of the solid homespun clothing in favour of the cheap and so-called cotton goods, end quote, and of stronger drinks for the so-called tea. Quote, the agriculturalist, after several hours' exposure to wind and rain, pins his cottage to sit by a fire of peat or of balls of clay and small coal kneaded together, from which volumes of carbonic and sulphurous acids are poured forth. His walls are of mud and stones, his floor the bare earth which was there before the hut was built, his roof a mass of loose and sodden thatch. Every crevice is topped to maintain warmth, and in an atmosphere of diabolic odour, with a mud floor, with his only clothes drying on his back, he often sups and sleeps with his wife and children. Obstetricians, who have passed parts of the night in such cabins, have described how they found their feet sinking in the mud of the floor, and they were forced, easy task, to drill a hole through the wall to effect a little private respiration. 
it was attested by numerous witnesses in various grades of life that to these insanitary influences and many more the underfed peasant was nightly exposed and of the result a debilitated and scrofulous people there was no want of evidence the statements of the relieving officers of carmarthenshire and cardenshire show in a striking way the same state of things there is besides quote, a plague more horrible still the great number of idiots end quote. now a word on the climatic conditions quote, a strong southwest wind blows over the whole country for eight or nine months in the year bringing with it torrents of rain which discharge principally upon the western slopes of the hills trees are rare except in sheltered places and where not protected are blown out of all shape the cottages generally crouch under some bank or are often in a ravine or quarry and none but the smallest sheep and native cattle can live on the pastures the young people migrate to the eastern mining districts of glamorgan and monmouth carmarthenshire is the breeding ground of the mining population and their hospital the population can therefore barely maintain its numbers End quote. thus in cardiganshire eighteen fifty one there were forty five thousand one hundred and fifty five males and fifty two thousand four hundred and fifty nine females while in eighteen sixty one there were forty four thousand four hundred and forty six males and fifty two thousand nine hundred and fifty five females dr hunter's report in public health seventh report eighteen sixty five pages four hundred and ninety eight to five hundred and two and footnote quote, to the insufficient quantity and miserable quality of the house accommodation generally had says dr simon in his official health report quote, by our agricultural labourers almost every page of dr hunter's report bears testimony and gradually for many years past the state of the labourer in these respects has been deteriorating house room being now greatly more difficult for him to find and when found greatly less suitable to his needs than perhaps for centuries has been the case especially within the last twenty or thirty years the evil has been in very rapid increase and the household circumstances of the labourer are now in the highest degree deplorable except in so far as they whom his labour enriches see fit to treat him with a kind of pitiful indulgence he is quite peculiarly helpless in the matter whether he shall find house-room on the land which he contributes to till whether the house-room which he gets shall be human or swinish whether he shall have the little space of garden that so vastly lessens the pressures of his poverty all this does not depend on his willingness and ability to pay reasonable rent for the decent accommodation he requires but depends on the use which others may see fit to make of their right to do as they will with their own however large may be a farm there is no law that a certain proportion of labourers dwellings much less of decent dwellings shall be upon it nor does any law reserve for the labourer ever so little right in that soil to which his industry is as needful as sun and rain an extraneous element weighs the balance heavily against him the influence of the poor law in its provisions concerning settlement and chargeability footnote in eighteen sixty five this law was improved to some extent it will soon be learned from experience that tinkering of this sort is of no use and footnote under this influence each parish has a pecuniary interest in reducing to a minimum the number of its resident labourers for unhappily agricultural labour instead of implying a safe and permanent independence for the hard-working labourer and his family implies for the most part only a longer or shorter circuit to eventual pauperism a pauperism which during the whole circuit is so near that any illness or temporary failure of occupation necessitates immediate recourse to parochial relief and thus all residence of agricultural population in a parish is glaringly in addition to its poor rates large proprietors have but to resolve that there shall be no labourers dwellings on their estates and their estates will thenceforth be virtually free from half their responsibility for the poor Footnote in order to understand that which follows we must remember that close villages are those whose owners are one or two large landlords open villages those whose soil belongs to many smaller landlords it is in the latter that building speculators can build cottages and lodging houses and footnote how far it has been intended in the english constitution and law that this kind of unconditional property in land should be acquirable and that the landlord doing as he wills with his own should be able to treat the cultivators of the soil as aliens whom he may expel from his territory is a question which i do not pretend to discuss 
for that power of eviction does not exist only in theory, on a very large scale it prevails in practice, prevails as a main governing condition in the household circumstances of agricultural labour. As regards the extent of the evil, it may suffice to refer to the evidence which Dr. Hunter has compiled from the last census, that destruction of houses, notwithstanding increased local demands for them, had, during the last ten years, been in progress in 821 separate parishes or townships of England, so that irrespectively of persons who had been forced to become non-resident, that is, in the parishes in which they work, these parishes and townships were receiving in 1861, as compared with 1851, a population five and a third percent greater, into house room four and a half percent less. When the process of depopulation has completed itself, the result, says Dr. Hunter, is a show village where the cottages have been reduced to a few, and where none but persons who are needed as shepherds, gardeners, or gamekeepers are allowed to live, regular servants who receive the good treatment usual to their class. Footnote. A show village of this kind looks very nice, but is as unreal as the villages that Catherine the Second saw on her journey to the Crimea. In recent times the shepherd, also, has often been banished from these show villages. For example, near Market Harbour is a sheep farm of about five hundred acres, which only employs the labour of one man. To reduce the long trudges over these wide plains, the beautiful pastures of Leicester and Northampton, the shepherd used to get a cottage on the farm. Now they give him a thirteenth shilling a week for lodging, that he must find far away in an open village. End footnote but the land requires cultivation and it will be found that the labourers employed upon it are not the tenants of the owner but that they come from a neighbouring open village perhaps three miles off where a numerous small proprietary had received them when their cottages were destroyed in the close villages around where things are tending to the above result often the cottages which stand testify in their unrepaired and wretched condition to the extinction to which they are doomed they are seen standing in the various stages of natural decay while the shelter holds together, the labourer is permitted to rent it, and glad enough he will often be to do so, even at the price of decent lodging. But no repair, no improvement shall it receive, except such as its penniless occupants can supply. And when at last it becomes quite uninhabitable, uninhabitable even to the humblest standard of serfdom, it will be but one more destroyed cottage, and future poor rates will be somewhat lightened while great owners are thus escaping from poor rates through the depopulation of lands over which they have control, the nearest town or open village receive the evicted labourers. The nearest, I say, but this nearest may mean three or four miles distant from the farm where the labourer has his daily toil. To that daily toil there will then have to be added, as though it were nothing, the daily need of walking six or eight miles for power of earning his bread and whatever farm work is done by his wife and children is done at the same disadvantage nor is this nearly all the toil which the distance occasions him in the open village cottage speculators buy scraps of land which they throng as densely as they can with the cheapest of all possible hovels and into those wretched habitations which even if they adjoin the open country have some of the worst features of the worst town residences crowd the agricultural labourers of england footnote quote, the labourers' houses, in the open villages, which, of course, are always overcrowded, are usually in rows, built with their backs against the extreme edge of the plot of land which the builder could call his, and on this account are not allowed light and air, except from the front. End quote. Dr. Hunter's report, Loco Citato, page 135. Very often the beer-seller or grocer of the village is at the same time the letter of its houses. In this case, the agricultural labourer finds in him a second master, besides the farmer he must be his customer as well as his tenant. Quote, the hind, with his ten shillings a week, minus a rent of four pounds a year, is obliged to buy at the seller's own terms, his modicum of tea, sugar, flour, soap, candies and beer. End quote. Loco page 132. These open villages form, in fact, the penal sediments of the English agricultural proletariat. Many of the cottages are simply lodging-houses, through which all the rabble of the neighbourhood passes. The country labourer and his family, who had often, in a way truly wonderful, preserved, under the foulest conditions, a thoroughness and purity of character, go, in these, utterly to the devil. It is, of course, the fashion amongst the aristocratic Shylocks to shrug their shoulders pharisaically at the building speculators, the small landlords, and the open villages. 
they know well enough that their close villages and show villages are the birthplaces of open villages and could not exist without them the labourers were it not for the small owners would for by far the most part have to sleep under the trees of the farms on which they work and quote page one hundred thirty five the system of open and closed villages obtains in all the midland counties and throughout the east of england and footnote nor on the other hand must it be supposed that even when the labourer is housed upon the lands which he cultivates his household circumstances are generally such as his life of productive industry would seem to deserve even on princely estates his cottage may be of the meanest description there are landlords who deem any sty good enough for their labourer and his family and who yet do not disdain to drive with him the hardest possible bargain for rent footnote Quote, the employer is directly or indirectly securing to himself the profit on a man employed at ten shillings a week and receiving from this poor hind four or five pounds annual rent for houses not worth twenty pounds in a really free market but maintained at their artificial value by the power of the owner to say use my house or go seek a hiring elsewhere without a character from me does a man wish to better himself to go as a plate layer on the railway or to begin quarry work the same power is ready with work for me at this low rate of wages or be gone at a week's notice take your pig with you and get what you can for the potatoes growing in your garden should his interest appear to be better served by it an enhanced rent is sometimes preferred in these cases by the owner that is the farmer as the penalty for leaving his service and quote dr hunter loca page one hundred thirty two and footnote it may be but a ruinous one-bedroomed hut having no fire grate no privy no opening window no water supply but the ditch no garden but the labourer is helpless against the wrong and the nuisances removal acts are a mere dead letter in great part dependent for their working on such cottage owners as the one from whom his the labourer's hovel is rented from brighter but exceptional scenes it is requisite in the interests of justice that attention should again be drawn to the overwhelming preponderance of facts which are a reproach to the civilization of england lamentable indeed must be the case when notwithstanding all that is evident with regard to the quality of the present accommodation it is the common conclusion of competent observers that even the general badness of dwellings is an evil infinitely less urgent than their mere numerical insufficiency for years the overcrowding of rural labourers' dwellings has been a matter of deep concern, not only to persons who care for sanitary good, but to persons who care for decent and moral life. For, again and again, in phrases so uniform that they seem stereotyped, reporters on the spread of epidemic disease in rural districts have insisted on the extreme importance of that overcrowding as an influence which renders it a quite hopeless task to attempt the limiting of any infection which is introduced and again and again it has been pointed out that notwithstanding the many salubrious influences which there are in country life the crowding which so favours the extension of contagious disease also favours the origination of disease which is not contagious and those who have denounced the overcrowded state of our rural population have not been silent as to a further mischief even where their primary concern has been only with the injury to health often almost perforce they have referred to other relations of the subject in showing how frequently it happens that adult persons of both sexes married and unmarried are huddled together in single small sleeping rooms their reports have carried the conviction that under the circumstances they describe decency must always be outraged and morality almost of necessity must suffer footnote Quote, new married couples are no edifying study for grown-up brothers and sisters and though instances must not be recorded sufficient data are remembered to warrant the remark that great depression and sometimes death are the lot of the female participator in the offence of incest End quote. dr hunter loco page one hundred thirty seven a member of the rural police who had for many years been a detective in the worst quarters of london says of the girls of his village quote, their boldness and shamelessness I never saw equalled during some years of police life and detective duty in the worst parts of London. They live like pigs, great boys and girls, mothers and fathers, all sleeping in one room, in many instances. End quote. The Child Employment Commission, 6th Report, 1867, page 77. End footnote. 
Thus, for instance, in the appendix of my last annual report, Dr. Ord, reporting on an outbreak of fever at Wing in Buckinghamshire, mentions how a young man who had come hither from Wingrave with fever, in the first days of his illness slept in a room with nine other persons. Within a fortnight several of these persons were attacked, and in the course of a few weeks five out of the nine had fever, and one died. From Dr. Harvey of St. George's Hospital, who, on private professional business, visited Wing during the time of the epidemic, I received information exactly in the sense of the above report. A young woman, having fever, lay at night in a room occupied by her father and mother, her bastard child, two young men, her brothers, and her two sisters, each with a bastard child, ten persons in all. A few weeks ago, thirteen persons slept in it. End quote. Footnote Public Health, 7th Report, 1865, pages 9 and 14, and footnote. Dr. Hunter investigated 5,375 cottages of agricultural labourers, not only in the purely agricultural districts, but in all counties of England. Of these, 2,195 had only one bedroom, often at the same time used as living room, 2,930 only two, and 250 more than two. I will give a few specimens culled from a dozen counties. 1. Bedfordshire. Wrestlingworth. Bedrooms about twelve feet long and ten broad, although many are smaller than this. The small one-storied cots are often divided by partitions into two bedrooms, one bed frequently in a kitchen, five feet six inches in height. Rent, three pounds a year. The tenants have to make their own privies. The landlord only supplies a hole. As soon as one has made a privy, it is made use of by the whole neighbourhood. One house, belonging to a family called Richardson, was of quite unapproachable beauty. Its plaster walls bulged very like a lady's dress in a curtsy. One gable end was convex, the other concave, and on this last, unfortunately, stood the chimney, a curved tube of clay and wood like an elephant's trunk. A long stick served as prop to prevent the chimney from falling. The doorway and window were rhomboidal. Of seventeen houses visited, only four had more than one bedroom and those four overcrowded. The cots with one bedroom sheltered three adults and three children, a married couple with six children, etc. Dunton. High rents from four to five pounds. Weekly wages of the man, ten shillings. They hope to pay the rent by the straw plating of the family. The higher the rent, the greater the number that must work together to pay it. Six adults, living with four children in one sleeping apartment, pay three pounds ten shillings for it. The cheapest house in Dunton, fifteen feet long externally, ten broad, let for three pounds. Only one of the houses investigated had two bedrooms. A little outside the village, a house whose tenants dunked against the house side, the lower nine inches of the door eaten away through sheer rottenness. The doorway, a single opening closed at night by a few bricks, ingeniously pushed up after shutting and covered with some matting. Half a window with glass and frame had gone the way of all flesh. Here, without furniture, huddled together, were three adults and five children. Dunton is not worse than the rest of Bigglesworth Union. 2. Berkshire. Beenham. In June 1864, a man, his wife and four children lived in a cot, one-storied cottage. A daughter came home from service with scarlet fever. She died. One child sickened and died. The mother and one child were down with typhus when Dr. Hunter was called in. The father and one child slept outside, but the difficulty of securing isolation was seen here, for in the crowded market of the miserable village lay the linen of the fever-stricken household, waiting for the wash. The rent of H.'s house, one shillings a week, one bedroom for men, wife, and six children, one house let for eightpence a week, fourteen feet six inches long, seven feet broad, kitchen six feet high, the bedroom without window, fireplace, door, or opening, except into the lobby, no garden. A man lived here for a little while, with two grown-up daughters and one grown-up son. Father and son slept on the bed, the girls in the passage. Each of the latter had a child while the family was living here, but one went to the workhouse for a confinement, and then came home. 3. Buckinghamshire. Thirty cottages, on one thousand acres of land, contained here about one hundred and thirty to one hundred and forty persons. The parish of Bradenham comprises one thousand acres. It numbered, in 1851, 36 houses and a population of 84 males and 54 females. 
this inequality of the sexes was partly remedied in eighteen sixty one when they numbered ninety eight males and eighty seven females increase in ten years of fourteen men and thirty three women meanwhile the number of houses was one less winslow great part of this newly built in good style demand for houses appears very marked since very miserable cots let at one shilling to one shilling threepence per week water eaten here the landlords in view of the increasing population have destroyed about twenty per cent of the existing houses a poor labourer who had to go about four miles to his work answered the question whether he could not find a cot nearer no they know better than to take a man in with my large family tinker's end near winslow a bedroom in which were four adults and four children eleven feet long nine feet broad six feet five inches high at its highest part another eleven feet three inches by nine feet five feet ten inches high sheltered six persons each of these families had less space than is considered necessary for a comfort no house had more than one bedroom not one of them a back door water very scarce weekly rent from one shilling fourpence to two shillings in sixteen of the houses visited only one man that earned ten shillings a week the quantity of air for each person under the circumstances just described corresponds to that which he would have if he were shut up in a box of four feet measuring each way the whole night but then the ancient dens afforded a certain amount of unintentional ventilation four cambridgeshire gamblingay belongs to several landlords it contains the wretchedest cots to be found anywhere much straw plating a deadly lassitude a hopeless surrendering up to filth reigns in gamblingay the neglect in its centre becomes mortification at its extremities north and south where the houses are rotting to pieces the absentee landlords bleed this poor rockery too freely the rents are very high eight or nine persons packed in one sleeping apartment in two cases six adults each with one or two children in one small bedroom five essex in this county diminutions in the number of persons and of cottages go in many parishes hand in hand in not less than twenty-two parishes however the destruction of houses has not prevented increase of population or has not brought about that expulsion which under the name migration to towns generally occurs in fingringo a parish of three thousand four hundred and forty three acres were in eighteen fifty one one hundred and forty five houses in eighteen sixty one only one hundred and ten but the people did not wish to go away and managed even to increase under these circumstances in eighteen fifty one two hundred and fifty two persons inhabited sixty one houses but in eighteen sixty one two hundred and sixty two persons were squeezed into forty nine houses in basildon in eighteen fifty one one hundred and fifty seven persons lived on one thousand eight hundred and twenty seven acres in thirty five houses at the end of ten years one hundred and eighty persons in twenty seven houses in the parishes of fringingo southambridge whitford basildon and ramsden crags in eighteen fifty one one thousand three hundred and ninety two persons were living on eight thousand four hundred and forty nine acres in three hundred and sixteen houses in eighteen sixty one on the same area one thousand four hundred and seventy three persons in two hundred forty nine houses six Hertfordshire. this little county has suffered more from the eviction spirit than any other in england at natby overcrowded cottages generally with only two bedrooms belonging for the most part to the farmers they easily let them for three or four pounds a year and paid a weekly wage of nine shillings seven huntingdon Hartford had, in 1851, 87 houses. Shortly after this, 19 cottages were destroyed in this small parish of 1,720 acres. Population, in 1831, 452. In 1852, 832. And in 1861, 341. 14 cottages, each with one bedroom, were visited. In one, a married couple, three grown-up sons, one grown-up daughter, four children, in all ten, in another, three adults, six children. One of these rooms, in which eight people slept, was twelve feet ten inches long, twelve feet two inches broad, six feet nine inches high. The average, without making any deduction for projections into the apartment, gave about 
130 cubic feet per head. In the 14 sleeping rooms, 34 adults and 33 children. These cottages are seldom provided with gardens, but many of the inmates are able to farm small allotments at 10 shillings or 12 shillings per route. These allotments are at a distance from the houses, which are without privies. The family, quote, must either go to the allotment to deposit their ordures, end quote, or, as happens in this place, saving your presence, quote, use a closet with a trough set like a drawer in a set of drawers, and drawn out weekly, and conveyed to the allotment to be emptied where its contents were wanted, end quote. In Japan, the circle of life conditions moves more decently than this. 8. Lincolnshire. Langtoft. A man lives here in Wright's house, with his wife, her mother, and five children. The house has a front kitchen, scullery, bedroom over the front kitchen, front kitchen and bedroom, 12 feet 2 inches by 9 feet 5 inches, the whole ground floor, 21 feet 2 inches by 9 feet 5 inches. The bedroom is a garret. The walls run together into the roof like a sugar loaf, dormer window opening in front. Why did he live here? On account of the garden? No, it is very small. Rent? High, one shilling threepence per week. Near his work? No, six miles away, so that he walks daily to and fro twelve miles. He lived there because it was a tenantable cot, and because he wanted to have a cot for himself alone, anywhere, at any price, and in any conditions. The following are the statistics of twelve houses in Langtoft, with twelve bedrooms, thirty-eight adults, and thirty-six children. A summary of the table. This table shows that the total number of persons in those twelve houses varies from two to nine for one bedroom per house. End of table. Nine. Kent. Kennington. Very seriously overpopulated in 1859 when diphtheria appeared and the parish doctor instituted a medical inquiry into the condition of the poorer classes. He found that in this locality, where much labor is employed, various cots have been destroyed and no new ones built. In one district stood four houses, named bird cages. Each had four rooms of the following dimensions in feet and inches. Kitchen, 9 feet 5 by 8 feet 11 by 6 feet 6. Scullery, 8 feet 6 by 4 feet 6 by 6 feet 6. Bedroom, 8 feet 5 by 5 feet 10 by 6 feet 3. Bedroom, 8 feet 3 by 8 feet 4 by 6 feet 3. 10. Northamptonshire. Brynworth, Pickford and Floor. In these villages, in the winter, 2,030 men were lounging about the streets from want of work. The farmers do not always till sufficiently the corn and turnip lands, and the landlord has found it best to throw all his farms together into two or three. Hence, want of employment whilst on one side of the wall the land calls for labour, on the other side the defrauded labourers are casting at it longing glances. Feverishly overworked in summer, and half-starved in winter, it is no wonder if they say in their peculiar dialect, the parson and gentlefolk seem frit to death at them. At floor, instances, in one bedroom with the smallest size, of couples with four, five, six children, three adults with five children, a couple with grandfather and six children down with scarlet fever, etc., in two houses with two bedrooms, two families of eight and nine adults, respectively. 11. Wiltshire. Stratton. Thirty-one houses visited, eight with only one bedroom. Pentel in the same parish. A cot let at one shilling threepence weekly, with four adults and four children. Had nothing good about it except the walls, from the floor of rough-hewn pieces of stone to the roof of worn-out thatch. 12. Worcestershire. House destruction here not quite so excessive, yet from 1851 to 1861 the number of inhabitants to each house on the average has risen from 4.2 to 4.6. Batsy. Many cots and little gardens here. Some of the farmers declare that the cots are a great nuisance here, because they bring the poor. On the statement of one gentleman, The poor are none the better for them. If you build five hundred, they will let fast enough. In fact, the more you build, the more they want. According to him, the houses give birth to the inhabitants, who then, by a law of nature, press on the means of housing. Dr. Hunter remarks, quote, Now these poor must come from somewhere, and as there is no particular 
attraction, such as doles, at Batsy, it must be repulsion from some other unfit place, which will send them here. If each could find an allotment near his work, he would not prefer Batsy, where he pays for his scrap of ground twice as much as the farmer pays for his. End quote. The continual emigration to the towns, the continual formation of surplus population in the country, through the concentration of farms, conversion of arable land to pasture, machinery, etc., and the continual eviction of the agricultural population by the destruction of their cottages, go hand in hand. The more empty the district is of men, the greater is its relative surplus population, the greater is their pressure on the means of employment, the greater is the absolute excess of the agricultural population over the means for housing it, the greater, therefore, in the villages is the local surplus population, and the most pestilential packing together of human beings." The packing together of knots of men in scattered little villages and small country towns corresponds to the forcible draining of men from the surface of the land. The continuous superseding of the agricultural labourers, in spite of their diminishing number and the increasing mass of their products, gives birth to their pauperism. Their pauperism is ultimately a motive to their eviction, and the chief source of their miserable housing, which breaks down their last power of resistance, and makes them more slaves of the land proprietors and the farmers. Footnote. Quote, the heaven-born employment of the hind gives dignity even to his position. He is not a slave, but a soldier of peace, and deserves his place in married men's quarters to be provided by the landlord, who has claimed a power of enforced labour similar to that which the country demands of the soldier. He no more receives market price for his work than does the soldier. Like the soldier he is caught young, ignorant, knowing only his own trade and his own locality. Early marriage and the operation of the various laws of settlement affect the one, as enlistment and the mutiny act affect the other. End quote. Dr. Hunter, Loco Citato, page 132. Sometimes an exceptionally soft-hearted landlord relents at the solitude he has created. Quote, it is a melancholy thing to stand alone in one's country, said Lord Leicester, when complimented on the completion of Hookham. Quote, I look around, and not a house is to be seen but mine. I am the giant of giant castle, and have eat up all my neighbours. End, End footnote. Thus, the minimum of wages becomes a law of nature to them. On the other hand, the land, in spite of its constant relative surplus population, is at the same time underpopulated. This is seen not only locally at the points where the efflux of men to towns, mines, railroad-making, etc., is most marked. It is to be seen everywhere, in harvest time as well as in spring and summer, at those frequently recurring times when English agriculture, so careful and intensive, wants extra hands, there are always too many agricultural labourers for the ordinary, and always too few for the exceptional or temporary needs of the cultivation of the soil. Footnote. A similar movement is seen during the last ten years in France. In proportion as capitalist production there takes possession of agriculture, it drives the surplus agricultural population into the towns. Here also we find deterioration in the housing and other conditions at the source of the surplus population. On the special proletariat foncier, to which this system of parceling out the land has given rise, see, among others, the work of Collins, already quoted, and Karl Marx, De Artzinte Brumaire des Louis Bonaparte, second edition, Hamburg, 1869, pages 56, etc. In 1846, the town population in France was represented by 24.42, the agricultural by 75.58, in 1861, the town by 28.86, the agricultural by 71.14%. During the last five years, the diminution of the agricultural percentage of the population has been yet more marked. As early as 1846, Pierre Dupont in his ouvrier sang Mal vêtu, logé dans les trous, sous les combles, dans les décombres. Nous vivons avec les hiboux, et les larrons, amis des ombres. And footnote. Quote, Hence we find in the official documents contradictory complaints from the same places of deficiency and excess of labour simultaneously. The temporary or local want of labour brings about no rise in wages, but a forcing of the women and children into the fields, and exploitation at an age constantly lowered. 
as soon as the exploitation of the women and children takes place on a larger scale, it becomes in turn a new means of making a surplus population of the male agricultural labourer, and of keeping down his wage. In the east of England thrives a beautiful fruit of this vicious circle, the so-called gang system, to which I must briefly return here. Footnote. Sixth and last report of the Children's Employment Commission, published at the end of March, 1867. It deals solely with the agricultural gang system. End footnote. The gang system obtains almost exclusively in the counties of Lincoln, Huntingdon, Cambridge, Norfolk, Suffolk, and Nottingham, here and there in the neighbouring counties of Northampton, Bedford, and Rutland. Lincolnshire will serve us as an example. A large part of this county is new land, marsh formerly, or even, as in others of the eastern counties just named, one lately from the sea. The steam engine has worked wonders in the way of drainage. What were once fence and sandbanks bear now a luxuriant sea of corn and the highest of rents. The same thing holds of the alluvial lands won by human endeavour, as in the island of Exholm and other parishes on the banks of the Trent. In proportion as the new farms arose, not only were no new cottages built, old ones were demolished, and the supply of labour had to come from open villages, miles away, by long roads that wound along the sides of the hills. There alone had the population formerly found shelter from the incessant floods of the winter time. The labourers that dwell on the farms of four hundred to one thousand acres, they are called confined labourers, are solely employed on such kinds of agricultural work as is permanent, difficult, and carried on by aid of horses. For every one hundred acres there is, on an average, scarcely one cottage. A fen farmer, for example, gave evidence before the commission of inquiry, quote, I farm 320 acres, all arable land. I have not one cottage on my farm. I have only one labourer on my farm now. I have four horsemen lodging about. We get light work done by gangs. End quote. Footnote. Children's Employment Commission, 6th Report, Evidence 173, page 37. End footnote. The soil requires much light field labour, such as weeding, hoeing, certain processes of manuring, removing of stones, etc. This is done by the gangs, or organised bands that dwell in the open villages. The gang consists of ten to forty or fifty persons, women, young persons of both sexes, thirteen to eighteen years of age, although the boys are for the most part eliminated at the age of thirteen, and children of both sexes, six to thirteen years of age. At the head is the gangmaster, always an ordinary agricultural labourer, generally what is called a bad lot, a scapegrace, unsteady, drunken, but with a dash of enterprise and savoir-faire. He is the recruiting sergeant for the gang, which works under him, not under the farmer. He generally arranges with the latter for piecework, and his income, which on the average is not very much above that of an ordinary agricultural labourer, depends almost entirely upon the dexterity with which he manages to extract within the shortest time the greatest possible amount of labour from his gang. Footnote. Some gangmasters, however, have worked themselves up to the position of farmers of five hundred acres, or proprietors of a whole rows of houses. And footnote. The farmers have discovered that women work steadily only under the direction of men, but that women and children, once set going, impetuously spend their life force, as Fourier knew, while the adult male labourer is shrewd enough to economise his as much as he can. The gangmaster goes from one farm to another, and thus employs his gang from six to eight months in the year. Employment by him is, therefore, much more lucrative and more certain for the labouring families than employment by the individual farmer, who only employs children occasionally. This circumstance so completely rivets his influence in the open villages that children are generally only to be hired through his instrumentality. The lending out of these individually, independently of the gang, is his second trade. The drawbacks of the system are the overwork of the children and young persons, the enormous marches that they make daily to and from the farms, five, six, and sometimes seven miles distant, finally the demoralization of the gang. Although the gangmaster, who in some districts is called the driver, is armed with a long stick, he uses it but seldom, and complaints of brutal treatment are exceptional. He is a democratic emperor, or a kind of Pied Piper of Hamelin. He must therefore be popular with his subjects, and he binds them to himself by the charms of the gypsy life under his direction. Coarse freedom, a noisy jollity, and obscenest impudence give attractions to the gang. Generally, the gangmaster pays up in a public house, then he returns home at the head of the procession, reeling drunk, 
propped up right and left by a stalwart virago, while children and young persons bring up the rear, boisterous, and singing chaffing and bawdy songs. On the return journey, what Fourier calls phanerogamy, is the order of the day. The getting with child of girls of thirteen and fourteen by their male companions of the same age is common. The open villages which supply the contingent of the gang become Sodoms and Gomorrahs, and have twice as high a rate of illegitimate births as the rest of the kingdom. Footnote. Quote, Half the girls of Ludford have been ruined by going out in gangs. End quote. Logo Citato, page 6, paragraph 32. End footnote. The moral character of girls bred in these schools when married women was shown above. Their children, when opium does not give them the finishing stroke, are born recruits of the gang. The gang in its classical form, just described, is called the public, common, or tramping gang, for there are also private gangs. These are made up in the same way as the common gang, but count fewer members, and work not under a gangmaster, but under some old farm servant, whom the farmer does not know how to employ in any better way. The gypsy fun has vanished here, but according to all witnesses the payment and treatment of the children is worse. The gang system, which during the last years has steadily increased, clearly does not exist for the sake of the gangmaster. Footnote. Quote, they, gangs, have greatly increased of late years. In some places they are said to have been introduced at comparatively late dates, in others, where gangs have been known for many years, more and younger children are employed in them. End quote. Loco Citato, page 79, paragraph 174, and footnote. It exists for the enrichment of the large farmers, and indirectly of the landlords. Footnote. Quote, Small farmers never employ gangs. End quote. Quote, It is not on poor land, but on land which affords rent of from forty to fifty shillings, that women and children are employed in the greatest numbers. End quote. Logo Citato, pages 17 and 14. To one of these gentlemen, the taste of his rent was so grateful that he indignantly declared to the commission of inquiry that the whole hubbub was only due to the name of the system. If instead of gang it were called the Agricultural Juvenile Industrial Self-Supporting Association, everything would be all right. End footnote. For the farmer, there is no more ingenious method of keeping his laborers well below the normal level, and yet of always having an extra hand ready for extra work, of extracting the greatest possible amount of labor with the least possible amount of money, and of making adult male labor redundant. Footnote. Quote, Gang work is cheaper than other work, that is why they are employed. End quote. Says a former gang master, Logo Citato, page 17, paragraph 14. Quote, the gang system is decidedly the cheapest for the farmer, and decidedly the worst for the children. End quote, says a farmer, Loco Citato, page 16, paragraph 3. And footnote. From the exposition already made, it will be understood why, on the one hand, a greater or less lack of employment for the agricultural labourer is admitted, while, on the other, the gang system is at the same time declared necessary on account of the want of adult male labour and its migration to the towns. Footnote. Quote, Undoubtedly much of the work now done by children in gangs used to be done by men and women. More men are out of work now where children and women are employed than formerly. End quote. Loco Citato, page 43, paragraph 202. On the other hand, quote, the labour question in some agricultural districts, particularly the arable, is becoming so serious in consequence of emigration, and the facility afforded by railways for getting to large towns, that I, the I is the steward of a great lord, think the services of children are most indispensable. End quote. Loco Citato, page 80, paragraph 180. For the labour question in English agricultural districts, differently from the rest of the civilised world, means the landlord's and farmer's question, that is, how is it possible, despite an always increasing exodus of the agricultural folk, to keep up a sufficient relative surplus population in the country, and by means of it keep the wages of the agricultural labourer at a minimum? And footnote. The cleanly weeded land and the uncleanly human weeds of Lincolnshire are pole and counterpole of capitalistic production. Footnote. 
The public health report, where, in dealing with the subject of children's mortality, the gang system is treated in passing, remains unknown to the press, and therefore to the English public. On the other hand, the last report of the Children's Employment Commission afforded the press sensational copy always welcome. Whilst the liberal press asked how the fine gentlemen and ladies and the well-paid clergy of the state church, with whom Lincolnshire swarms, could allow such a system to arise on their estates, under their very eyes, they who send out expressly missions to the Antipodes for the improvement of the morals of South Sea Islanders, the more refined press confined itself to reflections on the coarse degradation of the agricultural population, who are capable of selling their children into such slavery. Under the accursed conditions to which these delicate people condemn the agricultural labourer, it would not be surprising if he ate his own children. What is really wonderful is the healthy integrity of character he has in great part retained. The official reports prove that the parents, even in the gang districts, loathe the gang system. Quote, there is much in the evidence that shows that the parents of the children would, in many instances, be glad to be aided by the requirements of a legal obligation to resist the pressure and the temptations to which they are often subject. They are liable to be urged, at times by the parish officers, at times by the employers, under threats of being themselves discharged, to be taken to work at an age when school attendance would be manifestly to their greater advantage. All that time and strength wasted, all the suffering from extra and unprofitable fatigue produced to the labourer and to his children, every instance in which the parent may have traced the moral ruin of his child to the undermining of delicacy by the overcrowding of cottages, or to the contaminating influences of the public gang, must have been so many incentives to feelings in the minds of the labouring poor which can be well understood, and which it would be needless to particularize. They must be conscious that much bodily and mental pain has thus been inflicted upon them from causes for which they were in no way answerable, to which, had it been in their power, they would have in no way consented, and against which they were powerless to struggle. End quote. Loco Citato, page Roman numeral 20, paragraph 82, and Roman numeral 23, page 96. End footnote. End of Part 7, Chapter 25, Section 5, Part E.